Cybercrime. It's scary. Cybercrime is terrifying. Cybercrime is nothing compared to a cross-country road trip with kids. <laughs> It was the 80s, and my father decided that we were going to take a trip across the country. Uh, this was before cell phones and before the internet, so he scheduled everything in advance, and we had a schedule. And by God, we were going to stay to that schedule. Well, there was a particular risk threatening that schedule: unplanned bathroom breaks. My father had a uh, solution, a way to mitigate that risk. He taught my brother and I a new skill set: how to uh, urinate in a Pepsi can. <laughs> well, by day three, we had mastered our craft. We were so competent, in fact, that we no longer sought parental approval or、uh, supervision to execute nature's call. So one such occasion, I reached forward and I picked up a Pepsi can, and there was something different about this one. It was cold. My little six-year-old brain really didn't register that fact, and I、uh, again answered nature's call and put the can back. <laughs> My chest swelling with pride. That I was contributing, to, and the van swerved to the right, and my father let off a stream of curse words. Some of these so good, I use them today.、Uh, <laughs> so, whose fault was that? The adorable six-year-old? Sure, I did indeed pee in my father's Pepsi can. <laughs> But I believe that he holds some of the responsibility as well. He had the incorrect belief about his safety. He had drank from a Pepsi can hundreds of times before while driving, with no negative consequences. <laughs> he didn't understand that the risk landscape has changed. There was a six-year-old in the car who could pee in a can. <laughs> so, <laughs> while yes, I did pee in his can, his incorrect belief compared to the actual threat led to unhealthy behaviors. Let's unpack that a bit. Belief leads to emotion. Emotion leads to behavior, and behavior over time leads to habit. See, I think that cybersecurity professionals have a lot to learn from road trips. Cybersecurity isn't about computer science; it's about behavioral science. So let's talk about that just a little bit. We know in behavioral science that you can modify a habit, you can change someone's behavior, but if you don't address the core belief, that behavior will come back. So we do a lot of training, we do a lot of effort to try to change that modification of that behavior, but we really don't address those core beliefs. And this will be a bit general, but I want to cover three core beliefs that most of us share. The first one: I'm not important, and no one's looking for me. The second. I don't have anything anyone would want, and the third, maybe most depressing, I can't stop them. I can't stop them. Don't worry, we're going to get through this. <laughs> Belief number one: I'm not important, and no one's looking for me. Good news, all of you out there with low self-esteem. You are exactly what the cyber criminals are looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't believe me, I have data, and you know that's great for convincing people. Um, and I know this isn't really going to impact anybody.、Uh, no one really believes the data, but I don't feel like it could be taken seriously unless I present a graph. Present a graph. So I went through the problem of collecting this data. Please be polite enough to consume it. Here we go. Forty-eight <laughs> percent of us work for small businesses. Forty-nine percent of small businesses have been hacked. Seventy percent. Of cybercrime is directed towards small business, and 75% of employees have risky cyber behavior. And here's the worst part: of companies that have had a critical hack, something more than just a malware or something like that, 60% of them go out of business in under six months. This is bad news, guys. Don't worry, we'll get through it. Like I said. So, how's what's changed? <laughs> What's changed? <laughs> We used to believe hackers looked like this young man, nerds in the basement tinkering around with computers. What's changed is now they have more in common with Al Capone. 
Organized crime has entered the picture, and they have gone through a innovation cycle with their techniques that should make any Silicon Valley entrepreneur impressed. Let's use imagery to explore. Here we see our hacker in his natural habitat, apparently in a river. It's a metaphor, guys. So it's a skilled individual using a set of tools to get one fish. And while this skilled individual is engaged with that behavior, the rest of the fish are safe. Well, with technology and automation, we can have less skilled people reach out blindly, touch every single one of us, and then look for vulnerabilities. So, beliefs. I'm not important and no one wants, uh, and no one can find me, to you're super important. And thanks to automation, they're going to find you. <laughs> Next belief. I don't have anything anyone would want. And this is true if your belief is that what people want are intellectual property or um, trade secrets or just something very important data-wise, right? Well, that's not it anymore. Let me tell you a story about my friend Tom. Tom owns a business. It's a manufacturing company. It's a uh, products roll off his line, and he makes money. He uses that money to pay his employees, to reinvest, to probably get a boat. I don't know. Um, but four months ago, Tom got hacked. One of his employees exercised their 75% unhealthy, risky cyber behavior and clicked on a link they shut him down. Malware was installed on the computers in his network, spread around until it found the command and control center, the computer that controlled the actual line, and that was hit with ransomware. The whole hard drive was then encrypted. And the bad guys said, give me 1,500 Bitcoin, and we'll unlock it for you. Well, he had a couple problems. First, Tom had no idea what a Bitcoin was. <laughs> Second, Tom had no idea what to do. He turned out he did the right thing. He did not pay. He took three days to bring himself back up. Thank goodness he had the ability to do that. But with that line being down for three days, it really disrupted his business. And I'm not in manufacturing, but if you know somebody is, and you say the line's been down for three days, they have a panicked look on their face. So let's modify this one as well. I don't have anything anyone want to, hey, I've got money, and they're going to disrupt my life until they get it. And it's not just businesses, by the way. The same thing that happened to Tom can happen to laptops, personal computers, etc. When they find you and they touch all these computers, they take the next step. They don't even know who you are, they just take the next step. So, third belief. I can't stop them even if I wanted to. Guys, I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm going to share a little bit. This talk sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> you came in here with some unhealthy belief, and I just made them worse. And I feel bad about that. Um, but I also feel like we've gotten kind of close. And I, uh, <laughs> I want to reassure you, I'm not going to leave you in this unhealthy state. So don't walk out on me. Hang on. I can't stop them even if I wanted to. Turns out this isn't the first time the word infection has had a high impact on our society. We used to have doctors who would cut people open and put their hands in them and then people would die. Yeah? <laughs> really hard solution, right? So, turns out, it's almost as straightforward to practice good cyber hygiene. Let's talk about that. Soap. Your soap and water for cyber hygiene are having good backups and a good cybersecurity insurance policy. Now, that means pretty much nothing. What I really mean is, you got to have a systematic way of backing your data up somewhere else where an adult, responsible human being who is not you is keeping track that it's happening, and when something goes wrong, we'll help you put the data back. Too many people just back it up on a jump drive or they say, I got Dropbox, I'm fine. No, that's not what we're talking about. The cybersecurity insurance policy is also a little less intuitive. You're not supposed to buy a cybersecurity insurance policy to get money when something goes wrong. You want to have a cybersecurity insurance policy so that professionals can help respond to your disaster. So whatever you're looking for, whatever you go get, make sure it's not just, here's some money, because that's not going to do any good. So if you've got a million dollars in your hand and you still don't know who to call, that million dollars is doing nothing for you. So 
The soap and water of cyber hygiene, backups, and insurance. But let's pretend you're a germ phobia kind of person. You don't want to have it touched at all. Gloves. Gloves. That is moving your systems and services to the cloud. Now, again, let's get a little granular with that. It's not moving it to the cloud. I'm just going to put everything on an online drive. No, it's moving services. For example, if you're using email, which anybody use email? Great. If you're using email and you're running it Outlook or you're running it locally, that's very bad because anything that happens to that machine, you're out of luck. Moving it to a service like Microsoft or Google or any of the other ones. And yeah, I know that sometimes they get in the news for being hacked, but they're still so much better at it than you are, right? <laughs> but you can't move everything to the cloud. You can't move all of this stuff. Some stuff just has to live on your local devices. And that's when you need a surgical mask. That is something very complicated. Stick with me. You know those automatic patches that Microsoft keeps trying to do? And you maybe are doing a PowerPoint presentation for a TED talk and kind of getting mad and keeps trying to reboot your computer? Yeah, just let it happen. See, most of the things that hit us nowadays are problems that have been around for a very, very long time. The solutions are out there. We just don't patch our machines. So. Get the stuff off the local machine, put it into a cloud, get it into a service that somebody else can manage, and allow automatic patching on your machines. And there's one other thing that every good surgeon has, and that is a plan. The National Institute of Standard and Technologies, NIST, that way you can sound cool at dinner parties, <laughs> use your tax dollars in 2013 to come up with that plan for you. If you go through this framework, You'll be able to identify your important stuff. You'll be able to protect your important stuff. You'll be able to detect when someone's messing with your important stuff. You'll be able to respond once you get an alert. And most important, you'll be able to recover after the horrible event happened. So you've got hygiene and a plan. Let's look at our beliefs one more time. You are super important, and they're going to find you. <laughs> you got money, and that's why they're looking for you. And they're going to screw with you until they get it. But you can drastically reduce the risk of getting infection by practicing good cyber hygiene. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my hope that if you do these things and you adopt these beliefs into your core being, that you'll be able to avoid the horrible, horrible consequences of your behaviors. Thank you very much.